It's taken a little while, but I finally have my hands on Intel's i7-12700K. Specifically, this is the 12700KF, thanks to the lovely folks at CyberPair who sent over an entire system and both retail versions of the 12900K and this 12700KF. I've already tested both the i5 that the system came with and the i9 in a video recently comparing those retail chips to my review samples, so do check that out in the cards above. But now, it's time to check out this bad boy and see how it stacks up against its, against its peers. Just so that everyone is up to speed, this is the i7-12700KF. It's a 12 core, well 12 core chip based on 8 performance cores and 4 efficiency cores, meaning it has 20 threads total. It also runs up to 5 gigahertz on a single core with Turbo Boost Max 3.0, although its base clocks are actually slightly lower than the, in theory, lower end i5 12600K at 3.6 gigahertz for the P cores and 2.7 gigahertz for the E cores or 100 megahertz lower on each. By default, it's capped at 190 watts of maximum turbo power and can use either DDR4-3200 or DDR5-4800 within its warranty window or limits anyway. The F on the end of this one means that it's the version without integrated graphics, although the specs otherwise are identical between the K and KF models, and when not in use, the iGPU shouldn't be using any power anyway, so they should be functionally the same. Naming-wise, it should line up nicely with AMD's Ryzen 7 5800X. Although specs, and as you'll see in a second performance-wise, it runs more in line with the Ryzen 9 5900X, which is likely why it's priced quite neatly well between the two of those. But how does it actually perform? Well, let's take a look. Starting with the CPU-specific benchmarks and Cinebench, in single-threaded work, unsurprisingly, it sits right between the i5-12600K and i9-12900K, and squarely at the top of the field holding a pretty healthy lead over, well, everything else. In multi-threaded, despite it only having eight high power, high performance cores available, it still just about manages to beat even AMD's full fat 12 core 5900X. It's within spitting distance, but it's still a victory nonetheless. In a slightly longer workload though, like the BMW scene rendering in Blender, the 5900X manages to scrape the lead, again, by a, a, just an absolute hair, a single second. If that isn't trading blows, I, I don't know quite what is, but interestingly, the 8-core 5800X had a much more, well, rough time by comparison even being beaten out by the 10-core uh, the 12600K with its six performance cores and four efficiency cores. Interestingly though, in the much longer and much heavier Blender Gooseberry render, the 5900X extends its lead so much that it's only a hair behind the 16-core the i9. The 5800X catches up too, it's still a fairly significant portion behind, but it is now ahead of the 12600K. In Premiere, or the, the Puget Bench Suite 4 Premiere, uh, if that's more your thing, then you'll find the 12700KF is clearly a solid choice on at least performance alone, as even the 5900X is well, a fair bit behind. It's also not far behind the i9 as well. After Effects has a more sizable lead over everything else, save for the 11600K, which I still can't really explain why that's the case. But anyway, the 12700KF and the 12900KF score are actually incredibly close together, which actually shows you the sort of diminishing returns of getting a, a higher end chip, at least in After Effects. Finally, in Photoshop, it's a similar story, with the newer 12th gen chips holding a solid lead over 
almost everything else. When it comes to gaming, I had a rather strange time with CSGO, which I'm putting down to the, the hybrid architecture causing, well, causing some more trouble again. You'll see why I say that later on, but for now, this is the stock out of the uh, box sort of performance and experience that I ended up with. It's still not what I would call bad performance by, by any means, but it's far from perfect as even the i5 managed almost 100 FPS more with only the 11600K scoring lower here. The Cyberpunk results though look much better, with the i7 sitting second only to the i9 just how Intel would want it, and importantly, those three have a healthy gap to the rest of the field. Now, it's not absolutely night and day, but 20 FPS, especially between 120 and 140, isn't exactly insignificant. Watch Dogs Legion shows pretty much the same setup, with the i7 sitting nicely between the i5 and i9, and all three sitting comfortably above the rest of the field, with a 26th FPS lead over the 5900X. Now, sadly for Intel, the same can't be said for Microsoft Flight, as all three Ryzen chips hold basically the same position as the Intel ones did in Cyberpunk at around 140 FPS versus the Intel chips sitting more like 120. It is worth mentioning that all of these benchmarks are at 1080p and generally medium settings, although that's described at the top of the graph, uh, and you can see a, a lot less difference from any of these chips in, in any of these games if you're playing at 1440p instead, so do keep that in mind. And lastly, we have Fortnite, which, much like CSGO, sees the 12700KF running at practically the bottom of the pile. Now, it's still a very, very tight grouping, so I really wouldn't be too worried here. Uh, and things like, you know, the location of where you are on the map and just what you're doing, if you're inside or outside in a gunfight or just running around, all of those sorts of things will vary your actual frame rate much more than any of these chips will. So on the face of it, the 12700K or KF is a pretty decent chip, both from the productivity side and for gaming, with the only catches being things like, well, like I was saying at the launch, that if you're buying any of these chips, you are effectively paying to be a beta tester. There are bugs, there are issues that you'll run into, and it seems like it's taking a very, very long time to get even a single post-launch update out. But still though, the raw power here is clearly impressive. Now, most channels would normally leave it there, but if you've seen my other Alder Lake reviews, you'll know what's coming next. Here is how each of the types of cores perform independently of each other. Starting again with the CPU-specific tasks, you can see that in Cinebench R23 single-threaded, the uh, 12700KF actually improves its score when using just the performance cores on their own. Now, it's not by all that much, but it is a little, whereas, as you might expect, the E cores are actually almost exactly half as fast. In multi-threaded though, that's where it gets actually really rather interesting, as even those four uh, with the four E cores disabled, the 12700K or KF is still faster than both the 12600K with all 10 of its cores, all six performance and four efficiency cores enabled, and the 5800X and actually by a pretty considerable margin. Of course, with the four E cores on their own, uh, they're gonna be the pretty much the same four that you'll see in the 12600K, and so those are going to be very, uh, well, towards the bottom of these charts, but they're gonna perform pretty similarly on the whole. Blender also shows some interesting results, as in the BMW scene, the i7's 8P cores still outperform everything from the 12600K, 10850K, and 5800X, and doubt. And of course, the E core as well, they aren't exactly fast. Um, in the, the Gooseberry scene, uh, I was actually surprised by just how close the 5800X gets to the 8P cores from the i7. 
I mean, 42 seconds per frame is still incredibly substantial, but as a percentage, there actually isn't all that much between them in that longer, more memory intensive render. In Premiere Pro, the 12700K's 8P cores, well, they practically tie with the 5900X and bring the 5800X a fair bit closer into, into the mix, into contention. The E-Core still lags significantly, again matching the i5's uh, E-Core performance. In After Effects, the P-Cores show a substantial improvement of uh, almost 10% more performance when not otherwise sort of impeded by the E-Cores. That is impressive. Although, strangely, the E-Cores on their own actually scored worse than the 12600K's E-Cores, and I'm not really sure what's going on there. And in Photoshop, well, it's again a, a very strange result as the 12700K's P-Cores actually take a, an insane, a, a just outright confusing lead, but they also, the E-Cores are again significantly lower in performance, so I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but it does show you that at very least in certain applications, disabling those E-Cores can actually give you more performance than leaving it all uh, you know, enabled and as stock. When it comes to gaming, that holds a few answers from earlier. Specifically in CSGO, where the i7's P-Cores score significantly higher than their, their stock results. Now, it's still not quite where I would expect it to be. It's still technically slower than 12600K, but it's definitely a, a noticeable improvement over stock. That's the same in Cyberpunk, where the 12700KF sees a 10 FPS increase from disabling the E-Cores. In Watch Dogs, the results stay the same, even down to the 1% lows, uh, and that's because to be able to run Watch Dogs Legion, you have to disable the E-Cores, it just flat out wouldn't run on the E-Cores alone. As for Microsoft Flights, well, strangely the performance actually declines slightly with only the E-Cores, the P-Cores, and the E-Cores are, uh, again, taking to the back of the field as usual, although they're remarkably playable, at least with this RTX 3080 that I'm testing with. Lastly, in Fortnite, you can see the reason I expected some sort of shenanigans with the hybrid design before, as with the E-Cores disabled, it jumps to pretty much the top of the chart, albeit still a fairly tightly packed chart, uh, of course, save for those uh, E-Core runs, which are, again, still remarkably playable. So, is the 12700K F better than the 5900X? Well, it is, at least in some regards. Generally speaking, as 1080p medium settings gaming performance is stronger, but I'd argue that if you're going to be spending around 400 or more pounds on a CPU alone, you probably aren't, or perhaps shouldn't, be gaming at 1080p, so any gap that's present here in, in these benchmarks uh, definitely shrinks as the resolution increases. In CPU heavy work, it's almost always faster, especially thanks to that incredibly fast single threaded performance. Although I should note that I've been testing with DDR5 for these Intel CPUs, which if you could even find some, is a hefty premium over the DDR4 that you might already have and what you need for all of the other non 12th gen chips. You of course can use ZR4 with these though, and if you want to see how that compares, do check out my video on that one recently in the cards above, but generally speaking it can be, uh, I would say, a little hit or miss. When it comes to the cost, well it is easy to just look at the cost of the chips and declare the i7 the victor thanks to its both lower price tag and generally slightly better performance. Even if you exclude the cost of the RAM, the motherboards are a fair bit more expensive, especially compared to a reasonably priced B550 board for the Ryzen CPUs. The Z690 board that I've been testing with is an ASUS Formula board, which will set you back something like 600 plus pounds, and even if you go with a, a more sort of mid-range uh, DDR4 board, for example, like the ASUS Z690 Strix AD4 that I've been testing with recently, well that's still going to set you back like 320 pounds, 
instead of between 120 and about 180 for a decent B550 board. Factoring in that definitely swings the value proposition, as does the 190 watt power usage at stock versus the 142 watts for the 1500X, which might mean a, a bigger cooler might have to fit on that list too. On the whole, the i7 is a pretty decent chip. It offers great single and multi-threaded performance. It's generally good for gaming, with the catches being price, power, and bugs. Seeing the, the P and E core performance on their own though is honestly getting me more excited for the versions of these chips that at the very least are, are rumoured to have no E cores at all, the, the 6 and hopefully 8 core uh, performance core only options really can't come soon enough. With that said, those are my thoughts and the, the benchmark results, but I would love to know your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you think of the 12700K or KF? Is it a chip you'd pick up yourself or would you go with one of the, the lower end or higher end? Would you go with Ryzen instead or are you just not buying right now? Feel free to let me know in those comments down below. If you want to pick up the 12700K or KF, I'll leave a link or potentially links to those at the top line of the description for you to check out. Those are Amazon affiliate links that will take you to your local Amazon store. We can see pricing when and we watch this because it can and does vary. And I'll also leave a link to the entire CyberPower system if you want to buy that one instead or spec it out to however you fancy. Uh, and that's kind of it really. If you want to support the channel, uh, I, I'm taking a, a little Christmas break. Uh, I'm doing one video this Friday, but then uh, a little uh, potentially week or so off after Christmas and then back to work at the start of the, the new year. So if you want to stay up to date on all of those entire year worth of videos yet to come out, then do hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. If you want to catch up on any more, there are plenty of videos on the other cards. I have a whole load you can check out, including plenty of the previous testing, like DDR4 versus DDR5, and a load of other testing with these chips, so do check those out. And also feel free to check out the other links in the description. If you're buying from places like Overclock UK, I have an affiliate link down there for that. Or if you want a VPN, there's a few options down there for you or a load of other stuff. You can also support directly through the YouTube join button or Patreon instead, or even just pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one if you fancy. Otherwise, that's kind of it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.